we need to learn how to do that. Because sometimes you're all by yourself. And sometimes you actually cannot articulate what's going on. Sometimes what God does, when God is doing something in your life, there are no English words to talk about it. Uh, you just can't put it in words. And when you begin to tell people you just don't know how I feel, they think you're crazy. Because you can't articulate what God is doing because what God is doing is so deep and so great. And sometimes it starts out painful. But then at the end of the process, you find yourself saying, Lord, when it started out, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know why. But now I know. Let us pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. We belong to you. And those of us that are here that don't belong to you will have an opportunity to become a member of the family. But God, take me out of the way so you can, in fact, have your way. Minister to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The title for today's message is A You Know What Moment. A You Know What Moment. And I'm telling you the truth, I actually got this title from my sister-in-law. I call her Aunt Pam. Because sometimes I mess with Aunt Pam. I said, Aunt Pam, you know we're going to start having praise and worship for two hours before service. And she'd be like, you know what? Hannah had a you-know-what moment. The title of this message is a you-know-what moment. Life brings about many challenges sometimes. I think we need to be careful not to always paint life as bleak and messed up. Because there are some good days and some good times. But sometimes in church we get accustomed to telling all the glory and forget the glory. We, we, we need to explain that I'm in a mess, but I'm surviving because God is still with me. That, 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 that God has not allowed this thing to overwhelm me. When the enemy released it on my life and my family and on the church and the ministry, the intention of the enemy was to destroy, overwhelm, and sift like we. But God stepped in because we belong to him and you belong to him. God stepped in and he altered and changed. Like, even though I feel the rain, I'm not in the hurricane. See, sometimes when there's a hurricane in another part of the United States, we get some of the rain, but we're not in the hurricane. See, their houses and, and stuff are being destroyed and flying around, and all we got to do is get a new umbrella because it turned inside out. I'm just trying to explain that stuff is released sometimes, but not without God's permission. And we don't have to rally and jump around talking about, oh, yeah, Lord, I praise you for the cancer. No, I praise you because you're a healer. Let's keep that straight. We want people to think we're loony soon. I praise you because you're a healer. I praise you, God, because no matter what comes my way, you can handle. And if it's your permissive will, then I know you got me. Life brings ups and downs at times. It brings situations that appear to be insurmountable, situations that look as though they will never change. In addition to this, many people that we encounter in life don't care about or have any compassion for us. You ever see some folks that are just cold-blooded? They don't care what you're going through. They don't care how you feel. As a matter of fact, they ask you how you're doing. They really don't care. It's just nice to ask folks how they're doing. You've got to be careful because some folks will tell you how they're doing. And you need about an hour. And you walk away talking about, oh, Lord. Lord, I'll never ask sister, brother, so, so, can have, oh, woo, they went all the way back to 1950. Woo, Jesus. Don't ask unless you're very interested and that you have time. Don't ask. Amen. 
But sometimes folks don't have compassion. Because some folk, they haven't been through much. God's been real good to them, or, or life has been real good. They haven't been through anything yet, and they don't have compassion, and they don't care about what you're going through. They start talking about you, teasing you and criticizing you, and because of your life situations, and sometimes people will take what's going on in your life and define you by what's going on in your life. And if you're not careful, if you're on the receiving end of this criticism and this ostracize and everything, you're not careful, then you begin to start thinking crazy about yourself. And what others say about you and think about you can destroy you and put you in bondage and make you think you are worth nothing and we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. And because I don't look like much right now, don't mean that your dirt is better than mine. You were made out of dirt, I was made out of dirt. All right, my mama from South, I was made out of red dirt. But there's dirt. Don't let folk mess you up. What makes some of these situations worse is when it happens to us, when it appears that what God has done. The scriptures say that God shut up our womb. That, 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 you got to be careful with that. God did it. And some folk will take that and say, But you can, don't forget who God is. If God did it, God could undo it. Or if God did it, God can do something with it. Or God did it for a reason. God does not do stuff just to do stuff. Just because he has the power over us and just because he can. See, God, God's not built like that. God, you read his word as, as the altar prayer, as, as Mr. Sean said, he's a loving God. He's not waiting with his big back to beat you upside the head. God doesn't just mess with us. God loves us. Made us in his own image. Sent Jesus Christ to redeem us and reconcile us back to him, as Ephesians said, for the fellowship with us. But sometimes we... we, we, we Get messed up and forget that God has a plan for your life. And the plan for our lives may not always start out pretty and clean. As a matter of fact, some of us, if we didn't go through anything, we wouldn't be here right now. And some of us, we don't need to admit it, it's good that God didn't give us a good old happy, happy, slappy life. Because we'd be a mess. We need some trials and tribulations. We make some mistakes. God needs to be the one that's able to, to let us know that he is, in fact, God. But if everything was going right, some of us would never even call on God, uh, you know, pray to God, seek God, get saved, read the Bible, nothing. We wouldn't seek him out. That's why I said the blessing of sin is that I'm a candidate for salvation. Sin messes you up so much that you, if you want to be saved, you, you, God is uh, specializes in those of us who are sinners. Now, those of us who are not sinners, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know where you're going to go. I don't know who's going to help you. You're in a league all by yourself. But for poor little old me and folk like me, thank God for Jesus. But God still has a plan for your life, even if he shut up your womb. And and don't look at it just as don't look at it in a gender way, just Hannah. This could happen for Hannah or Hank. And shutting the wound could be non productive for a moment. And you still gotta love God because there's no other God. Who else you gonna go to? If God shut up something in your life, who else you gonna go to to get it open or find out why? What other God who else has the key to your life? We've given your life to Christ. Who else can handle what's going on in your life but God. But at first Samuel will see what Hannah did with her situation. She had a you know what moment. First of all, Hannah was one of Elkanah's two wives. Now, that was the custom then. Today, that's the problem. <laughs> that was the custom in biblical times. Today, that'd be a problem. If you're in this church and you're married to somebody who's got another wife, you got a problem. I don't care how many times he take you to Shiloh. I don't care how many times he give you presents. You got a problem. 
And if, you, and if your husband has another wife, you don't know about it, you still got a problem. That went over somebody's head. If I don't know about it, that's, I refuse to deal with that fact. What you don't know won't hurt you. That's a lie. Because if you don't know Jesus, you hurt. You done. People go, what you don't know won't hurt you. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're hurt and you're done. Elkanah's other wife, Penina, she's a trip. I say she's a trip because she had some kids. She had some children, sons and daughters. And you see, um, it wasn't good to be barren because back in the day, Hannah had been unable to conceive children in the Old Testament times. A childless woman was considered a failure. A childless woman was considered a failure. Her barrenness was a social embarrassment for her husband. Children were a very important part of society's economic structure. They were a source of labor for the family. I heard somebody say that. Why do you think I got these kids? Go get me this. <laughs> well, a source of labor for the family. It was their duty to care for their parents in their old age. If a wife could not bear children, she was often obligated by ancient Middle Eastern custom to give one of her servant girls to her husband to bear children for her. Adam, I'm uh, Abraham, remember? Sarah got mad. Go ahead, take her. Girlfriend comes switching around the house. <laughs> with, with child? Sarah said, she got to go. <laughs> of all the times, Abram, you listen to me. All these other times, you don't listen to me. I'll give you this young girl. That's pastor's interpretation of it. The Bible didn't say that. But Hannah had no children. And in and, 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 and verse 5 of 1 Samuel chapter 1 says, But Hannah gave, but, but unto Hannah, Elkanah gave her worthy portion, for she had no children. But he loved Hannah, but the Lord has shut up her womb. Wow. And not only was she barren, and not only was it God that shut up her womb, she had an adversary. They didn't even say they had separate houses. So she lived in there around Penina. And Penina talking about, you ain't got no kids. You ain't worth nothing. You failure. Look at you. What you good for? What? How can I really don't need you? I don't know why I keep you around. Go clean my bedroom, you know. <laughs> Folk can get evil and nasty like that. But then it taunted her and criticized her and humiliated her because she was barren. That's deep when you think about it. You're already feeling bad about what's going on in your life. And here comes somebody pouring salt into the womb. And always messing with you. Hey, where's the barren one? Can you imagine? How Hannah had to walk around. And Elkanah was talking to her, trying to encourage her. But sometimes people don't know your pain. They don't really know what you're feeling inside, but you got to do something with that pain. That's why I say Hannah had one of those, and you know what, moments. And some of us need to get there because you've been telling that story too long. You've been beating that drum just a little bit too long. By about the tenth year, you ought to be doing you something ought to be doing happening in your life. You ought to. But every year, Elkanah would go up to Shiloh. That was their custom. The, the, the men had to go up and worship three times a year. But he went up every year with Peninnah and her children and Hannah and her and with no children. And what they, every time they went, he would give them presents. So Peninnah would get a present and all her kids would give presents. And Hannah, he would give her one present, but a worthy portion because the, he loved her, but she didn't have any kids. This caused some problems. Look at verse 3 of 1 Samuel 1. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. Now, in retrospect, God was doing something in Hannah's life, but... You know, his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. 
So Hannah just thought she was messed up because she got this other lady just always in her ear, messing with her, talking about her. And it seemed like Hannah wasn't a violent one because I know some of the sisters I grew up with, if you mess, if you put your mouth on, you, you maybe you weren't barren, but your mouth would be closed, you know. Uh, never mind. And verse 4, and when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughter's portions. But unto Hannah, he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. Look at verse 6. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. She was nervous and fretful. Look at verse 7. And as he did so year by year, when she went up, to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Even on the way to church, Peninnah, her adversary, was still messing with her. They walk in the church. At least, I would think if you go in the church, you might be nice. You go to the Lord's house. They're on their way to church. She's still messing with her. Walking all next to her. What's up, Hannah? Hannah Huzzy, how you doing? Look at her. Come on. See, y'all, y'all got the sanctified stuff. She probably called it worse stuff than that. It's not in the word, but her adversary. Adversary don't mean you no good. She's trying to go to church. They're going to church. And every year they went up. And she provoked her. And she was crying and didn't want to eat. She was crying, crying, and lost her appetite because of Panetta. It's bad enough that the Lord shut up her womb. And now she got to be reminded on a daily basis, even in church. I can see Panetta sitting behind her, tapping on the shoulder. Hannah. Hannah. Were your children, Hannah? Huh? Hannah, you see my sons and daughters? Look at all they gifts. And verse 8, Elkanah tried to encourage her. Elkanah said, said to her, Hannah, why weep it down? In other words, I love you. I try to give you a worthy portion. Don't worry about Peninnah. I'm a divorce. That's not in there. Uh, don't worry about Peninnah. And why eatest thou not? He said, you ain't eating no food. You. Come on, babe. You're getting frail now. I don't want to put out a missing person bureau on you. K-5, you you're losing. You're not eating. And why is your heart grieved? And he said, am not I better to be than ten sons? He said, I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying, I'm trying to show you how much I love you. And I'm not coming down on you because you can't have children. I love you. But Hannah said, you can't feel what I feel on the inside. I, I, I want to have a child. I can't have a child. The Lord shut up my womb. And Peninnah is always messing with me and ostracizing me and criticizing me and making me feel worse than I already feel, making me feel like I'm nothing. You better be careful when you got folk around you like that. Listen to that stuff. Looking at them like they somebody and they talking you down. But see, when you get to verse 9, that's when Hannah had one of those you-know-what moments. In verse 9, Hannah rose up. She rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. Hannah rose up and went to church. Hannah rose up and went to church. You know what? She had one of those, you know what, mom. you know what? I'm tired of Peninnah's mouth. That's a you know what. You know what? I can't live like this. You know what? I'm tired of being, you know, the one talked about and the one stepped on and the one walked on and the one always ostracized. How come I got to be the brother of everybody's joke? You know what? Hannah had one, you know what, you know what, I ain't living like this no more. Peninnah, she's no better than I am. I'm God's child, just like she's God's child. But when you let all that poison get in your spirit, you walk around with your head down, with your spirit bowed down to the earth, acting like you nobody because you don't have children.
But Hannah rose up. So you got to raise up. <laughs> to raise up out of that mess. Folk talking about you all the time. I, I'm no folk that had to leave the church because folk were talking about. And guess what? After they left church and went to another church, they were still the same because they never rose up. Instead of escaping the comments, ask God about the situation. So, so Hannah rose up. She had one of the you-know-what moments. It's a moment when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired and tell yourself, you know what? I can't live like this no more. I'm getting up out of this mess. They ain't going to talk about me like this no more. I know the God that I know God loves me. I don't know the plan he has for my life. I know right now he shut up my wound, but I know God might try to do something. He's trying to do something in my life. I don't know what it is, and maybe I can never have children, but I'm still worth something to God, and I know God can do something with You got to tell yourself that. I, sister or brother, don't keep doubting yourself by what people tell you. I, oh, I got children. Turned down here. My mother said I wouldn't be nothing. My daddy said I wouldn't be nothing. Everybody around me said I wouldn't be nothing. You got to raise up out of that. You got to have a you know what moment. I'm tired of hearing that. That's when you decide I might be barren, but I'm no longer going to be sitting back here and letting my barrenness control my life. And you know what moment is when you decide I'm sick and tired of listening to what others have to say about me negatively and allowing that negativity to get all in my spirit and begin to control my life and make me feel all depressed and dark and down. I'm wearing black clothes every day. I got black lights in my house. I done shut my blinds. I gave up my job. I don't want to eat. I'm in here dying because of what they're saying about me. And, and they made me think that God has done something negative to me because of what they're saying. Oh, you better get your ears anointed. Because your ear gates and your eye gates, you got to be careful who you let all in your space. Be careful who you worship. Be careful who you look up to. They might not mean you no good. I, 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 there's some folks feel better when you're around because they're miserable, but they don't want to let you know that their misery would love some company. See, because I got children, I feel better off because you don't have children. I got children, don't know what to do with them, can't raise them. As a matter of fact, they telling me what to do. They running my life, but because you don't have no children, I'm better off. I got children, I don't know what to do with them. And they telling me what to do, but because you don't have children, I'm better than you. People can make stuff look like it's better than your stuff. You know what moment. Hannah had one of those moments. Sometimes you like to get to that point. They messing with you on the job. You got to, you know what, you know what? Let me get my resume together. <laughs> I, y'all never had a moment like that? The enemy trying to mess up your marriage. You know what? Let's go, let's go seek the Lord. Let's go pray. Let's go get some counseling. Let's, That's when you decide, you get this revelation. Today, right now, is the day I'm going to raise up. Hannah rose up out of her depression. Stop feeling sorry for herself. You ever, you ever talk to somebody and they try to tell you and you can see that they in a depressed state and you try to encourage them? And they would take your encouragement and turn around, but, but, but you don't understand and you ever find somebody want to stay where they are? You got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired of your own stuff. Some days you got to look in the mirror and tell yourself the truth. This is not what God called me to be, uh, to do. This is not what he called me to be. You got to look at yourself sometimes. And say, I'll tell you, no, I don't care how much the dress costs, how much the suit costs, a mess. In a dress is a mess. A mess in a suit is a mess. Get me out. You stop dressing it up. I got coats. I got Chanel. And feeling like hell. You got to have one of the moments. You know that. And you know what moments. So she had a you-know-what moment. Look at verse 10. 
And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept sore. She was bitter and she was crying, but she went to the temple and she told God about it. So you've got to be able to rise up out of your depressed state and go to church. Because sometimes you get to a point, you don't want to go nowhere. You don't want to talk to nobody. You're mad with God. You don't want to talk to God. But when you get that moment when you raise up, when you get tired of living like this, tired of being like this, tired of people talking about you, when you know that God is greater than all the mess that you've been hearing about yourself, and they talked about the woman at the well, she had all these husbands and everything. I tell people, look, regardless of that, who did Jesus come to? We're talking about her, how she did this and did that. But look, what's that? Is that Hosea? Where's Gomer? And is that the book of Hosea? Am I right? It says, I love Israel. Hosea, go marry a prostitute. Wow. Don't get messed up on God's love. I don't care what we do, I don't care where we've been. God's love is greater than all that stuff. So this is what Hannah did. She rose up. She had that moment. I think of verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me. Be careful what you vow to God. But I realized that she wanted a child, but she loved God more than she loved the child. She wanted a child so bad, but she loved God so much more than the child that she vowed to give the child back to the Lord. She said, God, I love you. But if you remember me, I will give the gift you give me back to you. So many times we change up. Lord, give me some money. God, if you give me some money, I'm going to bless my church. You get that money in your hand. <laughs> and we hope to see you in church. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Hey, that's all right. Oh, Lord. God, if you give me off this sick bed, I'll never take another drink. As soon as you got up, where you at? Down the bar. God, if you, if you let me get off these drugs, I'll never touch them again. Where are you at? Be careful what you say out of God. It should be, Lord, help me. If the Lord help me. This stuff is real. But she thought of said to the Lord of hosts, that thou wilt indeed look on the afflictions of thy handmaid and remember me and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man child. Then I will give them unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. The whole Nazarite vow, he can't, he, you know, his hair would be cut. He is unto the Lord. But think about it. This is a vow she made. She said, I don't want a child to shut Penina up. Oh, so many times we want something that we can shut the people up that's talking about us, not Hannah. She ain't fall for that. I don't want a child to shut Penina's mouth. I want a child for your glory. Oh. Nowhere in First Samuel it says Penina's children were dedicated to the house. Not saying they weren't. But look at verse 12. And it came to pass that she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Here she is, praying to God, finally getting this thing out. She'd been living like this too long. Penina been messing with her for so long. She finally got to get this thing out. She, she rose up to, I'm going to church, and I'm going to tell God. She got to get mad sometimes. God's not afraid of you being angry and being upset. God can handle it. Get mad sometimes about what the enemy's doing in your life. And stop letting the enemy have way in your life and way in your marriage and way in your mind and way in your heart and have his way in your spirit. If you got something going on in your life, check in with God. Just stop the time you come home talking about, I'm sorry, baby. I won't do it no more, baby. No, make sure you don't do it no more. Get some help. Get some spiritual help. And get some earthly help. Understand you got a problem saying something going on in your life. And go tell God, God, I need you. But when you make a vow, be truthful with this thing. Eli, Eli marked him out. Eli looked at her and said, now she's speaking from her heart. Only her lips move. Sometimes it get deep like that. See, sometimes you got to get, sometimes a prayer will come out your pain. She's moving her, her lips and her heart is speaking. But her voice is not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. The Lord has, so you can get so bad sometimes folks think you're drunk. You walk down the street crying. What's wrong with that fool? 
There's so much going on. You're so overwhelmed that you've got to get somewhere and tell God about this thing. So Hannah's there. And Eli said unto her, how long will thou be drunk and put away thy wine from thee? And Hannah answered and said, oh, no, my Lord. I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. When's the last time you and I poured out our soul before the Lord? Count not thy hand made for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken. Out of the mess that's gone on in my life, I put lips on my pain, I put lips on my grief, I put lips Oh, 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 what's going on? And I gave it to God. Look at verse 17. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. See, when you have one of those you-know-what moments, I think Hannah's life is about to change. Don't you tell me what God can't do. I don't know what God's going to do in your life, but in Hannah's life, God bless her with her prayer request. I don't know what God is doing in your life. I'm not going to say you're going to grant your request, but look what he did with Hannah. And she said, let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and the countenance was no more say, oh, that's what you call a breakthrough. Her prayer got, before that she was crying, it wasn't easy. In my mind, she went back to Panetta, get out the kitchen. I'm hungry. I don't care if your kids ain't or not. I'm back. My spirit been restored. My joy has been restored. I don't care what you say. My ears have been anointed. My mind has been anointed. That stuff you used before won't work no more. I'm built up in my most holy faith. I'm built up in my spirit. I went and had a little talk with Jesus. I feel the prayer wheel turning. I feel the fire burning. She was no more sad. It didn't say Penina stopped messing with him. That's why God said business is mine. For messing with you and talking about you. Take that stuff to the Lord in prayer. Uh-oh, verse 19, she rose up again. And they rose up. Early in the morning, worshiped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord what? Well, her prayer was, if you don't forget about me, if you remember the handmaid. And she walked away in a confidence that God heard her prayer. She put a petition before God. But she didn't tell God how to answer or when to answer. We got to get to a point in our lives where we can give our petition to God. Say, God, however you want to bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. But what I said in my prayer, I meant, if you give me a child, I'm going to give the child back to you. Sometimes you got to get a prayer out of your pain. Stop going after the one that's talking about you and go after the one that created you. Because just because you're barren right now, don't mean you're going to be barren always. Oh, see, 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 he who lasts first, <laughs> lasts last, lasts last. You think you're doing better than me right now, it looks like. But see, you don't know I got in touch with God. She didn't say nothing to, to Eli. She didn't say nothing to Penina. You know what? I'm going to pray for you, you wicked woman. You know we do sometimes? We want folks to know. We want them to know. I'm a, you know. If it wasn't for God, I'd smack you. <laughs> come, come. Oh, I know y'all Christians and everything, but you know sometimes folks get all up in your skin, get all on your nerves. Have you further away from God if you're not careful. But sometimes you got to ask God to purge your spirit. 
Sometimes you can take up so much negativity and darkness in your life. Folks been telling you ain't nothing, and every time you made a mistake, they, they talk about you. They put, they put it out on blast. They put it on Facebook. When you do something right, you don't hear nothing. But as soon as you do something wrong, it's all over the place. You messed up. You married the wrong person. You joined the wrong church. You got the wrong job. All your kids crazy. Everything about you is negative. And Hannah said, guess what? And you know what? I'm going to take everything to the Lord in prayer. I dare for you and I to package everything that is negative, that's bothering us in our life. Package that thing and take it to Shiloh and say, guess what, God? I can't live like this no more. I had a you-know-what moment. You know what? God is greater than all this. He said he came, and Jesus came that I have life and have more abundant. I want my abundant life. I want my blessings. I want whatever you have in store for me. I'm tired of people talking me out of my blessings. I'm tired of people talking about me. And hold, I'm tired of them. Everything I do, they talking about it. They holding me down. They making me feel this way. They making me feel that way. And God, I know you great. I don't know why I allow myself to be subject to all that nonsense. But I got a revelation the other night. I rose up out of my mess. And you know what? I am not going to die of starvation because you run in your mouth. I'm going to eat. I'm going to be joyful. How come Panetta can be happy and Hannah can't be happy? See, children, see, Panetta thought it was the children. The children got her more gifts. But Hannah's barrenness got her more God. Oh, hallelujah. Whole lot of folks got a whole lot of things, but a whole lot of folks don't have a whole lot of God because God ain't interested in the things. He's interested in the hearts. She came to him without the stuff. She came to him to him weary, wounded, and sad, and found in him a resting place. And now she's glad. That's where Samuel can see God had another had another mission for her. He had another plan for her life. Samuel, the last judge and, and priest of Israel and prophet came through Hannah's womb because she took him and put him in under the care of Eli when he was old enough and left him in the temple like she died. What did you promise God that you still have at your house, that you still have at your heart, that you still have in your closet, and you have not given it to him yet? And we got the nerve to come to him and God and for other stuff. And God said, I don't know if I can trust you or not, because you say you will do such and such, and you never did it. That's why I told Abraham, go and, and, and sacrifice Isaac. And then after Abraham did everything, he said, now I know. When the last time you promised God something? God, if you, if you just bless me, I'll study your word. God, if you bless me, I'll help build your kingdom. God, if you bless me, I'll be a witness. And as soon as you got over that hurdle, Hannah kept her promise. Because everything that we have actually belongs to God. And if you can't give it back to him, what good is it? If you can't use it for his glory, what good is it? But somebody in here today, somebody been messing with you and talking about you and making you feel bad about how you look and how you talk and where you came from, but my Bible tells me all things work together for the good to them who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. Don't be fooled by all this stuff on TV. You're supposed to weigh a certain amount. Your hair supposed to be this length. You're supposed to be this color skin. You're supposed to smell this way. You're supposed to drive this car. You're supposed to vacation there. You're supposed to eat this car. Don't be fooled by that. We ought to be exactly who God called us to be. And there's some penitence in your life that's been all up in your ear. And you got to seek God. I'm not saying don't respect those that have been counseling you and giving you advice. But run that counsel and run that advice by the Bible. And if it don't line up with the word of God, it doesn't line up with what God gave you. And stop beating up yourself. Raise your hand if you've been beating up yourself. Raise your hand. I won't see you. Rich, and you've been beating up yourself. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
God didn't make any mistakes. God gave you exactly what you needed for this life. And because other folks don't understand how God made you, what God is doing, that doesn't mean you're a reject. That doesn't mean that you're a failure. It simply means that you're different. And God is a God of diversity. And I don't know what trial and tribulation that God's going to send in your life to get you to a place where you'll be like Hannah and come to the altar and pray unto him and to pour out your soul to him. But God is able to take care of you and to take care of me. Not based on what others said, but based on what I said about myself, what I believe about myself, and what I tell God about myself. It's not what my wife said. It's not what the congregation said. It's what I said to God about me. Because what I say is what I believe about me. And God said, hey, you're my child. And the best is yet to come. If you're here today and you're kind of down on your luck, so to speak, and you think that this is it for you, I challenge you today to check to see who your Savior is. Just like he asked the disciples, he says, whom do men say that I am? Stop letting the television, newspapers, and all these other kind of crazy televangelists that's not lined up with the word these preachers tell you who Jesus find out who Jesus is for yourself the Holy Spirit will reveal to you if you earnestly seek who Jesus is just like he told Peter but Peter said thou art the Christ the son of the living God I remember one time I preached a message called word what's the word on the street the word on the street is who is Jesus and then Jesus called them in and said, we need a meeting. Who do you say that I am? And as soon as they figured out who he was and accepted who he was, he said, here are the keys to the kingdom. God has the keys to your life. Today you're here, you think you're stuck. God said, come to me. Have one of those moments. You know what? I ain't being stuck. You know what? Let me get up off my gift. You know what? Let me stop sitting in church acting like I'm shy. You know what? Let me just stop all that nonsense. Let me stop holding back from God. Let me release. That's what Hannah did. She had a you-know-what moment. Some of us are so concerned. Pastor, Coach, Pastor, God is calling me to do this, but I'm so scared what the congregation is going to say. Don't be scared of the congregation. Congregation say what they want to say. But ultimately, the voice of God has superior authority. That's why you can't sleep at night. I'm not messing with somebody right now. I need to sit down. That's why you can't sleep. You can't rest right. Because God calling you to do something. You ain't do it yet. You're finding every excuse. We're good at that. Uh, next week. And then next week becomes next week. But God will say, release yourself unto me. Everything you desire, tell me about it. You can't fix yourself. Only God can do that. Otherwise, he wouldn't need Jesus. But you've got to have one of those moments where you tell yourself, you know what? I'm going to stop messing up myself. And for my brothers, I'm going to stop messing up my family. You want to be the head of your house? Act like it. Live like it. Pray like it. Walk like it. Talk like it. But have a, go have a talk with God about it. Hannah, Hannah had, had a little son. She took him right to the temple. That's like she promised. What have you promised God? You never know what God wants to do or is trying to do in your life if you never talk to him about it. Just like relationships. If you find somebody that attracted, you're attracted and they're attracted to you, you won't know much about them until y'all communicate. <laughs> God is saying, come talk with me. Instead of letting people talk about you, come talk with me. That's what Hannah did. She wouldn't talk with God. And she sought his will. And she saw God's face. See, when you get stuck in your own little world, that's your little world. You run that. God runs the great big world. He created it. And God loves you. And God cares about you. 
I challenge you today to find out who you really serve. Because the God I serve is greater than any situation in my life. And I found out I can't just serve him when I'm happy. I got to serve him when I'm not so happy. Because he's that kind of friend. He's that kind of God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The thing about Jesus is this. Before I had anything good to give him, he was willing to die for me. And then after he died for me, I accepted him. What I had good to give him, he gave to me to give to him. Anybody understand what I'm saying? (laughs) After he redeemed me, he gave me something good to give back to him. Nothing good was in me. I was like Adam and Eve. I had fallen into sin. But then he looked at my mess and died for me, got up for me. And when I said yes to him, he actually gave me what I needed to give back to him. Okay, gamblers. Just, okay, for the people that gamble. You went to Atlantic City. You went to the slot machine. You put all your money that you had in. And instead of you losing, it looked like you lost on the machine. But somebody came along and fixed it, and all this money came out, and you became a winner. Pastor, what are you saying? We're all losers. Save the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm a winner today because of the blood of Jesus, not because of my intellect, not because of my degrees, not because of where I've been, but because of who I belong to. I'm a, see, see, Panina had Hannah thinking that she was a loser, but Hannah said, you know what? Let me get up. You're a winner because of the blood of Jesus. Look at yourself as a winner. And when you come into situations that you feel like you're not a winner, it's just another challenge. That's all. That, it's just a little higher mountain. Just go back to the prayer. Go back to the altar. Tell God, guess what? I know I'm a winner. I know I am victorious. And I'm going to wait on you. Because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. Somebody say People say, I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to me, and I'm talking to you. God said, I'm about to turn your life around. You've been walking around, looking at the ground too much. You ought to be looking to the hills. For which I don't care what you got on. I don't care what you smell like. I don't care what you have in your bank account. God is saying, I am your God. I am your God. I'm the God. I got everything. I own everything. I love you. Come up out of that. Low self-esteem. And forgive yourself. God has forgiven us and some of us are still walking around. If you got a scar, that means you're healed. If you don't have a scar, that wound is still open. You give that thing to God. But have yourself in a you-know-what moment. And don't be upset. Tell somebody, you know what? You're going to shut up talking about me. I mean, you got to get like that. But you t- we tell everybody else off. Tell them. Tell the devil, you know what? You have too much free reign in my life. I serve Jesus. And my Bible tells me by, by the word of God and by the blood of Jesus, I have already overcome. Now, do what you got to do, but you ain't doing it in here. You better go out in the street somewhere. You gotta, and you got to mean it. You got to tell them that. And they got to wait on the Lord to change some things. We're so impatient. If God don't do it by July, I'm done with him. <laughs> and when, you, when God hear that, he laughs because God said, I don't know what month of the year it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just in time. I'm just, I made time for you. I'm just doing God. I don't know. What? 3.30 or July? What? I'm just doing God. I don't know what. To... God laughs at us. If he don't do it by Friday the 5th. God laughs at us. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm with you in a continuum. Whenever I do it, I'm going to do it. But just hold on to your faith because I got you. And whatever you vow to me, keep your vow. Keep your vow. Don't lie. That's the best thing. Because if you keep your vow to God, then you can keep your vows and your promises in life. Don't be a liar. Why you got to lie? You got to lie. Tell the truth. The truth is what makes and sets us free. But if you lie to God, 
then your brothers and sisters and your family members don't have a chance. If you're bold enough to tell God a lie, God, if you give me this child, I'll give this child back to you. Next time we see that child, that child somewhere in a fashion show somewhere, somewhere, ain't nowhere near the church. That's what God is requiring of us, to be truthful with him. And remember what Hannah did. She didn't have a child to shut Peninnah up. She had a child to give God glory. Because whoever's talking about you, let them talk. Because guess what? When God gets finished blessing your life, they're going to shut up. They be living with their mouth open, Sister Jack. I never thought. Then they be like, oh, I put my mouth on him. Oh, I put my mouth on him. God can do some great and wondrous things. And I don't care what's going on in D.C., what's going on in City Hall. The entire world could be bankrupt, but heaven is not. Let us all stand. And you know what? <laughs> I got one of you know what moments. Somebody